The human body reflects our innermost nature, its growth and decline, its external beauty, and the fascination of its inner organs have aroused man's curiosity for centuries. A marvel of function, and then sudden death. In its long history, the field of anatomy has attempted time and time again to comprehend the processes in the human body. Both in order to understand the ramifications involved and to develop new remedies. Today we have grown to take the art and science of medicine for granted. Life-saving machines have become all too familiar. However, without the pioneers of anatomy, without man's probing interest in the inner secrets of the body, the medical achievements of today would have been inconceivable. It was a renaissance that rediscovered man. Leonardo da Vinci's studies showing interior and exterior views of the body document a general interest in anatomy and in the dissections held publicly in those times. The dissectors delved ever deeper into the mysteries of the body. Thanks to the technique of plastination, the interiors of the body can now be durably displayed in a way that is more fascinating and more aesthetic than ever before. The purpose of this exhibition is to educate in the spirit of the Renaissance. But these are not works of art in the conventional sense. The main focus is on the artistry and complexity with which nature has created the human body. Authentic human bodies, dissected and plastinated by anatomists, tangible and comprehensible. Sheet plastination permits the body to be shown in cross-section. The structure is perceptible, layer by layer. The position of the organs and individual deviations become clear. Such knowledge is indispensable, for example, in utilizing computer-aided tomography. For sheet plastination, the cadaver is first fixed with the aid of a laser level. Next, it's frozen in acetone at minus 30 degrees Celsius and then foamed with polyurethane. Finally, millimetre-thin slices of the body can be made by means of special precision settings on the saw blade. After dehydration in acetone, the slices are rigidly plastinated in epoxy resin solution. Over 20 polymer compounds have been developed so far for various applications in plastination. Curing is done with the aid of ultraviolet light.
Whole body specimens demonstrate certain aspects of bodily structures. Each specimen permits different insights and ramifications, raises or answers new questions. Preparation of an entire body requires several weeks of work. Great care must be taken in exposing the structures to be shown. The reason for this is that the finished specimens are primarily to be used as demonstration and instructional materials in training medical students. And what will they do with the with the nervus infraorbitalis? Will it be on top or? Es ist genau wie er hier bleibt. Ah, Diese Seite. Ja. Das ist, ist die linie Grenze. After dissection, the process of plastination then follows. The bodies are first dehydrated in acetone and are then impregnated with silicone in a refrigerated vacuum chamber. During this process, the acetone effervesces out of the body through the action of a vacuum pump, thereby causing a vacuum in the tissue. This in turn gradually permits the plastic to be sucked into even the most minute cell. Upon completion of vacuum infusion, the specimen must be put into the desired pose. Ob wir das noch mal probieren, indem wir den Hals noch mal den Kopf nach hinten. Ja, ja, wenn das ginge, ja. Once the pose has been set, all anatomical structures, each and every nerve and vessel must be fixed in the correct position. This occurs with the aid of numerous ropes, wire, foam pads and needles. Especially designing is an intellectual and artistic achievement that has to be strategically planned and thought through again and again during implementation to be coordinated with the overall image. With new and complex specimens, this process can often take weeks until the pose of the plastinate finally harmonizes with the anatomical dissection. Producing a whole body plastinate requires an average of 8 to 12 months. Working on the rearing horse with rider dragged out over three years. Final curing of a plastinate occurs with the aid of gas and heat in an airtight chamber. All of the structures are then irreversibly solidified. The artists and scientists of the Renaissance knew about mortality. Death was ever present. In today's world, death and physicalness are being increasingly repressed. Death has been banished from our consciousness. An encounter with a dissected body can be a moving experience. It can teach us to appreciate this unique wonder, while at the same time reminding us how transitory life is.
Welcome to the Körperwelten exhibition, Fascination Beneath the Surface, an exhibition that will provide you with unique insights into healthy and diseased human bodies. When touring the exhibition, you will see organs separately and systematically organized by subject area, learn something about their functions and common diseases, and finally you will be able to study anatomical structures in their complex totality and in whole bodies. The bodies shown here are all authentic. They come from persons who decreed during their lifetimes that their bodies should be made available for plastination after their deaths, in order to serve in training and educating physicians, as well as medical laypersons. A special feature of this exhibition is that the specimens have been preserved with the aid of plastination. This not only permits durable preservation of these specimens, but more than that it also permits completely new forms of presenting anatomy, as the plastics used lend tissue a high degree of stability. Hence it is now possible to present anatomical specimens in dynamic, upright poses. Moreover, the anatomical structures themselves can be exhibited in a way that has been unknown before now. In traditional dissection, anatomical structures are gradually removed piece by piece with the aid of a scalpel, scissors or tweezers. First the skin and then the subcutaneous fatty tissue is removed, then the superficial muscles and then the deeper layers of muscles until the skeleton becomes visible. In contrast with plastinated specimens, it is possible to show the depths of bodily interiors without having to remove the superficial structures. Instead, artificial interspaces are created between the individual compartments. Fragments can be opened like doors or drawers. Or bodily fragments can be shifted in space in various directions, either on one level or in every direction in space. This form of dissection opens up informative insights and perspectives never seen before. Every person is unique. This is expressed not only in their visible outward appearance, also inside no two bodies are exactly alike. The position, size, form and attributes of the skeleton, musculature, nerves and organs determine the features of our inner face. This anatomical individuality could never be conveyed by using models. Models are only an interpretation, and one model looks like any other. With plastination, the authenticity of these specimens serves to fascinate viewers, while allowing them to experience man as a marvel of nature. This exhibition is devoted to the individual, inner face of man. An essential vital function of the body is movement. It is made possible by our locomotive system, which consists of bones, muscles and joints. 
The bones taken as a whole, namely the skeleton, form the internal framework of the body. With its more than 200 bones and 100 articular joints, it provides the body with stability, support and flexibility. Each joint is enclosed by a membranous capsule that stabilizes it. We can find cartilage wherever elasticity is required by the skeletal system, for example in the area of the sternum. Here the cartilage permits the rising and falling movement of the thorax during breathing. The surfaces of joints are also covered with cartilage. This reduces friction. Here we see a bent knee joint. The surface of the cartilage is as smooth as glass. If we look deeper, we see the cruciate ligaments. Here the outer collateral ligaments. And here the inner and outer meniscus. If the joint is arthritic, the cartilage will be increasingly lost, either through inflammation or wear. This knee joint already shows severe signs of abrasion on the articular surfaces. Knee and hip joints are especially prone to arthritis because they're subjected to stress caused by an individual's body weight and to severe wear during the course of a lifetime. In more extreme cases, a worn-out joint can be replaced by a prosthesis. A prosthesis is designed to emulate the natural joint in form and angle of inclination. It is cemented into the bone by means of a long shaft and is usually made of stainless steel, titanium or teflon. Nearly every bone has a hard compact outer zone or cortical substance and a core of spongy bone or trabecula. The latter is configured according to physical demands and forms lines of tension depending on the force of pressure and contraction. This structure lends bones substantial stability while at the same time remaining lightweight. The human skeleton only weighs an average of 10 kilograms. Nevertheless, it is stronger than reinforced concrete of the same size that will probably weigh four to five times as much. Bone fractures can heal well thanks to the unique capacity of bones to regenerate. However, to mend properly, the bone fragments have to be securely immobilized so that they cannot move. For this reason, with bone fractures, stainless steel screws, wires and plates are frequently used to join the fragments firmly, as can be seen in this exhibit. Surgical spreaders serve to keep soft tissue away from the bones during an operation. With complicated fractures, external fixators are used, such as shown here in the lower leg and here in the wrist section. The screws are secured to the bone through the skin. On the right side of the chest, we can see a pacemaker. The electrode of the pacemaker is inserted from behind the collarbone into a vein until it reaches the heart, where it is secured. At the back of this specimen, we can see an operation on the spinal column. Two neighboring vertebrae have been fused together with the aid of screws and connection pieces. Such surgical procedures are sometimes necessary with slipped discs. Bone disease can affect the entire organism. This severe deformation is usually caused by a hereditary dysfunction of bone formation. The internal organs have to adapt their shape and dilation to the unusual form of the torso. Contractions exerted by individual muscles that are attached to the bones set the skeleton in motion. These two specimens stem from one and the same body, the skeleton has been removed while the muscular system has been displayed separately. Skeletal muscles generally have a broader, more fleshy origin and bridge one or more joints from one end to the other. They transmit their pulling power to the bones via strong, inelastic tendons.
This body shows once again the two systems of the locomotive system separately from one another, namely in one half of the body the muscular system and the skeletal system in the other half. Moreover, this half allows us to see the internal organs. We can clearly see that the lung has been blackened by years of smoking. A fine network of nerve fibers extends from head to toe. These nerve fibers monitor and regulate all of the bodily functions. They emerge directly from the brain or from the medulla oblongata and branch out to the rest of the body in ever finer nerve fibers. They transmit information in the form of weak electrical signals. The brain is the body's control center that regulates every thought and nearly every movement. It processes sensory impulses and enables us to have consciousness, feelings, memory and language. This exhibit has been given the position of a pensive chess player because it shows how the human organism has been innovated. The pose is intended to highlight the particular character of this plastinet, its anatomical identity. The aesthetic impression we get is indeed intentional. The reason is that the results of plastination should at the same time appeal to both the mind and the emotions, that is, it should impart knowledge and awaken in us an awareness of nature. In this opened cranial cavity we can see the cerebrum. Below it, the cerebellum, which is responsible for coordinating our movements and our sense of balance. The spinal cord is connected to the brain. The peripheral nerves emanate from the spinal cord and extend from there to the muscles. From the lower part of the spinal cord, the sacral nerves run down to meet in bundles to form the sciatic nerve. This in turn extends over the ilium and along the posterior part of the thigh, where it branches again in the popliteal space behind the knee. When we fell back the cheekbone and temporalis, or temporal muscle, we can see the cranial nerves emanating from the brain. Here is the trigeminal nerve as it leads to the eye, as well as to the upper and lower jaws. It also supplies the mucous membrane of the upper jaw orifice, shown here exposed, which is often a source of inflammation. The brain lies in the cranial cavity like a walnut in its shell, completely protected from mechanical influences on all sides. Just under the cranium there is the cerebral cortex whose numerous convolutions and recesses extend well into the white matter. In a cross-sectional brain slice the grey matter of the cerebral cortex and basal ganglia can easily be distinguished from the white matter. Grey matter consists of nerve cells that emit and process impulses. White matter is nerve tissue consisting chiefly of nerve fibres. 
Inside the brain, there is a complex system of cavities in which fluid circulates. Here, beneath the corpus callosum, we can look into the right lateral cavity and the third and fourth ventricles. This fluid serves as a shock absorber to offset the jolts to which the brain is often subjected. When normal flow is obstructed, the fluid congests in the ventricles and causes them to become distended. With babies, such obstructions can also cause the skull to enlarge abnormally, because at this age the sutures of the skull have not yet completely ossified. In such cases, it is referred to as water on the brain, or hydrocephalus. The obstructions are usually caused by congenital malformation, inflammatory processes, or, as in this case, by tumor growth. The brain only accounts for about 2% of total body weight, but it requires 20% of the total blood supply. If the flow of blood to the brain were to be interrupted for only 10 seconds, we would lose consciousness. In this brain, we can see a massive hemorrhage resulting from a stroke. The blood permeates the brain matter, and in conjunction with the region affected by the stroke, dysfunctions can occur, such as loss of speech or paralysis. Should vital centers be affected, a stroke can also be fatal. Strokes account for 15% of all deaths. On this frontal brain slice, we can also see a massive deep black hemorrhage caused by a stroke, especially on the right hemisphere. The body's internal organs are embedded in two large cavities, namely the thorax, or chest, and the abdomen. Both cavities are separated from one another by a thin muscular partition. This is the diaphragm, our main respiratory muscle. Among the organs in the thorax, there are the right and left lungs, as well as the windpipe or trachea. And in the middle, the heart, with the entering and exiting blood vessels. Below the diaphragm, the liver is on the right side. Left of this is the stomach, which is shown cut open here. Below this comes the small intestine that is framed here by the large intestine. At the back of this specimen we see the spleen, and still further back the two kidneys with the descending ureters. The aorta, the main artery from the heart, runs parallel to the spine. Here it has been cut open. This body has been exposed lengthwise. It nicely shows the internal organs in their natural position. Up here, the tongue in the cavity of the mouth. Below it, the larynx, followed by the esophagus, and in front of it, the windpipe or trachea. In the thorax, we see the heart exposed, and under it, the dome-shaped diaphragm. Below the diaphragm comes the liver, the stomach, and the numerous loops of the small intestine. Finally, at the base of the pelvis, we see the bladder, and behind it, the rectum. The internal organs take over vital metabolic functions to keep our bodies operating. The lungs take the oxygen out of inhaled air, which is necessary for converting nutrients into energy. This air reaches the lungs via the larynx and the windpipe. The windpipe forks into the two main bronchi that lead into the left and right lungs respectively. There, the bronchi divide again and again like tree branches. They end in masses of tiny spherical sacs, the alveoli. They can best be seen in a cross-sectional slice through the lung. The alveoli are clustered closely together, like bunches of grapes on a vine, and are surrounded by blood vessels. This is where oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged. A healthy lung has approximately 400 million of these air sacs. Consequently, an area of about 100 square meters is available to transfer these gases. This specimen shows a healthy lung that encloses the heart in the middle. 
In contrast, there are massive deposits of tar in this lung, the result of years of smoking. Smoking cigarettes can damage lung tissue. The walls of the air sacs are destroyed and cause air spaces in the lung tissue to be formed that can never be abated. This results in shortness of breath and less stamina. This syndrome is called pulmonary emphysema. In this cross-section of a thorax, severe tar deposits can also be seen in the lung tissue. Here in the overview, we can recognize that a cancerous tumor the size of a fist has formed in the right half of a smoker's lungs. Oxygen is distributed throughout the body in the bloodstream by the heart. The heart is a hollow muscular organ which keeps the bloodstream constantly flowing. It pumps around 70 milliliters of blood per beat, around 70 times per minute at rest, and when exercising or running, even faster. In a human life comprising 75 years, that makes roughly 2.5 billion heartbeats. When a heart is opened longitudinally, we can look into all of its chambers. Here we can see the muscular left ventricle, next to it the right ventricle, and the two upper chambers or atria above. The left ventricle pumps blood to the body's circulatory system. The right one pumps it to the lungs. Cusp-like atrioventricular valves extend between the ventricles and the atria to prevent blood from flowing in the wrong direction. In this heart, the mitral valve has been replaced with an artificial valve. The heart and the blood vessels comprise the cardiovascular system. It ensures the transportation of oxygen, as well as vital nutrients and hormones to the individual organs, and also the removal of waste materials. The network of blood vessels is exceptionally dense. If all of the blood vessels in a single human body were laid end to end, they would wrap around the equator twice. The blood vessels that supply oxygen and nutrients to the myocardium are called coronary vessels. Here the left coronary artery has been dyed yellow and the right one red. Should the flow of blood in an artery be interrupted, the muscle fibers affected will no longer be supplied with blood and will die. This is called an infarct or heart attack. The necrotic muscle cells will gradually be replaced by a scar made up of connective tissue, as can be seen here in the apex of the heart. The wall of the heart in the affected areas is substantially thinner and appears whitish. With a fresh heart attack, the wall of the heart can also tear, as can be seen in this cross-section. In such cases, a significant amount of blood can escape into the pericardium, which then increasingly compresses the heart, thereby causing the victim to die. Here we can see an abdominal aorta. It has been cut open to show the inner wall. It has a smooth surface while the tiny holes are from smaller arteries that are branching off. The artery stems from a younger person. By contrast, this abdominal artery displays a severe case of arteriosclerosis. And there are artificial vessels in the region of the iliac arteries. The high internal pressure inside this aorta has led to a massive dilation of the vessel's damaged wall at several points. These saculations are called aneurysms. Aneurysms generally have thin walls and are filled with clotted blood. Should the wall tear, it can cause fatal hemorrhaging within a few seconds. Every region of the body has a constant demand for nutrients that are absorbed by the organs of the digestive system. These organs break down foodstuffs into such small particles that our blood can easily absorb them. Food is roughly chewed before passing through the esophagus to the stomach, where it is partially digested by chemical action. From there, food gradually passes to the duodenum and is mixed with digestive juices from the liver and pancreas. 
These almost completely break down the foodstuffs in the remaining loops of the small intestine. The individual nutrient molecules are then absorbed into the bloodstream through the wall of the small intestine. Indigestible food particles pass into the large intestine where they are thickened and are finally excreted via the rectum. Here we are looking at the mucous membrane of an exposed stomach. In the folds of the lining there are numerous glands that produce acidic juices, enzymes for breaking down protein and mucus to protect the stomach lining itself from being digested. In this stomach we can see a lesion on the back wall of the lining. This is known as an ulcer. And here we can see a large ulcer in the passage leading to the duodenum, which has certainly been there for several months, if not years. The small intestine is lined with a well-vascularized mucous membrane to absorb nutrient molecules. It is formed by annular folds and is covered with innumerable minute villi. This enormous enlargement of the surfaces ensures that the immense amounts of nutrient molecules can be absorbed into the blood. Not all of the nutrient particles reach the blood. Foodstuffs that the body cannot digest pass into the large intestine, where they are thickened through water absorption. This specimen shows the passage from the small intestine into the large intestine. The large intestine begins with the cecum on the right side of the lower abdomen, to which a worm-like or vermiform appendix is attached. This vermiform appendix can easily become inflamed and would then have to be removed by surgery. The liver is the central metabolic organ of our bodies and weighs an average of 2,000 grams. It has a reddish-brown color because of its rich blood flow. By comparison, this liver has become significantly enlarged and has a light color due to fatty deposits. A fatty liver is often an early stage of liver damage caused by alcohol. Permanent damage caused by persistent alcohol consumption can lead to cirrhosis of the liver. In this case, necrotic liver cells are replaced by connective tissue scars, the cells that are still functioning from small islands or nodules. In contrast to a fatty liver, liver cirrhosis cannot go into remission. This specimen illustrates how the internal organs are enclosed by the body shell. In the right hand of the plastinate we can see the gallbladder at the underside of the liver. The gallbladder is full of gallstones. This body displays a rare anatomical anomaly as its organs are arranged like a mirror image of the normal positions, a so-called situs inversus. The apex of the heart points to the right instead of the left, the liver is on the left side of the body while the spleen is on the right and the pancreas extends from left to right across the spinal column instead of vice versa. Statistically one in every 25,000 persons is affected by this harmless phenomenon of nature. The internal organs of the body also include the urinary system and the internal genital organs. Both systems of organs have been incorporated in the urogenital system owing to their close anatomical and functional relation to one another. Here we can see the kidneys on either side of the spine with the renal pelvis that empties into the ureters, which in turn lead down to the urinary bladder in the pelvic cavity. In males, the prostate gland is situated beneath the bladder, which encircles the urethra like a ring. Here it has been exposed lengthwise and shows the passage of the urethra. The prostate gland tends to enlarge with increasing age, which constricts the urethra and sometimes causes problems with urination.
kidneys play a key role in controlling water levels in the body and cleanse the blood of dissolved waste matter. The total volume of blood in a body flows through the kidneys approximately 15 times per hour. Blood is filtered in the renal cortex. Urine is concentrated in the medulla, from which it empties into the renal pelvis. There are numerous kidney diseases that can cause severe functional disorders. This kidney has been pervaded with numerous cysts and is significantly enlarged. Both symptoms were caused by a hereditary disease. In contrast, this kidney has been severely atrophied as a result of chronic infection. Such severe cases can only be helped by regular hemodialysis or a kidney transplant. Female reproductive organs are largely contained within the body. They include the two ovaries, the two fallopian tubes and the uterus. With each monthly cycle, an egg matures in the ovaries and is then captured by the funnel-like end of the fallopian tubes. Fertilization normally occurs on the way to the uterus. The egg then nests itself into the mucous membrane of the uterus. In this specimen, we can see once again the internal female genital organs, shown separately. In the middle, we can recognize the uterus. It has been cut open horizontally. We can recognize the fallopian tubes and the ovaries on either side. On this enlarged uterus, we can see several small growths called myomas. These are benign tumors resulting from uncontrolled growth of muscular tissue in the uterine wall. Myomas are quite common. However, in most cases, they do not cause any problems. Female breasts are also included with the external genital organs. Outside of pregnancy, they consist primarily of fatty tissue, as can be seen here on the left of the picture. The network of glandular ducts is so fine as to be scarcely visible to the naked eye. On the right, we can see breast cancer. Its hard tissue has almost completely infiltrated the breast. The functional systems of the human body can best be understood in their relative position to one another by using a series of thin transparent slices. The progress of individual organs and structures can then be followed from one cross-section to another without having to change their relative position to neighboring organs through dissection. On these frontal specimens we can follow, for example, the lungs, the liver and the spleen through a series of longitudinal slices. Finally, the heart becomes visible farther ahead. However, diseased organs can also be impressively presented with transparent body slices. For example, metastasis of malignant skin cancer, a melanoma, as shown here. Or here, there is extensive tumour growth in the chest cavity. This malignant tumour originates in the neuroglia and has displaced large parts of the lung. The tumour has also infiltrated the bones and is pressing on the spinal cord in the vertebral canal. And here we can still see traces and the remains of stitches from an operation. In this body, we can easily recognize why anatomical structures are often only partially cut open. If we consider the whole length of a bone, it becomes obvious that this whole length can only be visible in a given slice when it runs parallel to the direction of the cut. Even a slight bend in a joint or a different angle of a cut will be sufficient to alter the effect.
With these frontal slices, not all of the organs and tissue have been completely severed. On the contrary, some are projecting three-dimensionally from the surface of their slices and are thus missing in the adjacent slices. Their cavities indicate the position, form and size of the missing organs. A fertilized egg cell grows into a fetus in the uterus. Here we can see a three-month-old fetus inside the exposed uterus. During pregnancy, the fetus is nourished by the placenta, an organ that only exists during pregnancy. It is connected to the fetal organism by means of the umbilical cord. On the side to which the uterus is turned, we can see the capillary system. This is where the exchange of nutrients and oxygen takes place. In the first eight weeks of development, the prefetal product of conception is called an embryo. During this period, all of the systems of vital organs are formed. After eight weeks, the period of organ differentiation has been largely completed, and at this time the embryo looks very similar to a tiny child. The period of organ differentiation is a very critical phase in which abnormal development in a single cell could result in severe malformation of the new individual. For example, Siamese twins. They develop in the early phases of cell division if the cells or groups of cells divide incompletely. The chances of survival for Siamese twins are dependent upon the extent to which the two individuals share vital organs with one another. In this case, there is a severe malformation of the brain. The cerebrum and the cranium have virtually not been formed. This disease is referred to as anencephaly. A fetus with this malformation has no chance of surviving. This fetus has a defect in the walls of the chest and abdomen. The abdominal organs are protruding towards the front, while the heart has been completely displaced towards the outside of the chest. The phase of development following the embryonic period is largely characterized by growth processes and maturation of the organs. During this period, the product of conception is called a fetus. By the fourth month, the liver, the pancreas, the intestines and the kidneys have all been developed. Hair and nails begin to grow. In the fifth month, the nervous system begins to mature and the mother can feel the fetus moving. After seven months, the fetus has developed so far that it would survive in the event of premature birth. In the last two months, the fetus mainly gains in weight and size. The fetus shown in its mother's uterus is five months old. It has reached a length of 17 centimeters and has already begun to push out the mother's abdomen. In this body, we can see an advanced pregnancy in the eighth month. The uterus has now become substantially enlarged and displays the placenta on the front wall. It has been cut through the middle. At this advanced stage of pregnancy, the abdominal organs of the mother are being pushed upwards. 
The partially open chest cavity shows the heart with the right ventricle opened. This miracle of development concludes our tour. The eternal cycle of death and new life. Remember that you are mortal. This is suggested to everyone who attends the exhibition, especially by the Gestalt plastinates themselves. I was what you are. You can become what I am. And that brings us to body donors. The people who are exhibited here made a very conscious decision during their lifetimes to be available to the next generation for the sake of anatomical instruction. First, people attending the exhibition should get a clearer idea of their own bodies. We live in an artificial world. Normal persons are no longer conscious that they, themselves, are nature. Secondly, the intention was to present anatomy in a very concrete way. This exhibition is not about art or science, it's about instruction. Instruction in the fullest sense of the word, in that people attending the exhibition can realize their own vulnerability. In a prophylactic sense, since if people see how unhealthy habits or lifestyles concretely affect their own bodies, for example, smokers' lungs, heart attacks or meniscus damage, it will help them to gain a greater appreciation and perhaps a renewed sensitivity toward their bodies. My models are the Renaissance anatomists who pioneered the initial enlightenment in this field, Leonardo da Vinci and Andreas Vesalius. For the first time, they discovered the beauty of bodily interiors at a time when the beauty of bodily exteriors was the focus of an entire artistic epoch. In the late Middle Ages, Andreas Vesalius was the first to assemble a skeleton. He literally took it from the grave and returned it to society. I see myself in this tradition, and I am continuing it with the possibilities of plastination. By making it possible to solidify soft tissue, plastination permits bodies to be exhibited not only as skeletons, but also as skeletons with muscles and organs at the same time. And I do not display people as incomplete specimens. I do not use dissection to remove organs. Instead, I provide insights into bodily interiors. People can look inside. This only becomes possible when I can visualize partitions into the body or gaps in structures that are aesthetically worthwhile and instructive, and then expand the resulting fragments, open them like bodily doors, or even move them around in relation to one another. The resulting images of man, the unusual bodily forms, are thus a necessary consequence of my instructive efforts, but not their objective. A plastinate is a success for me when it's aesthetic, dynamic and instructive. Aestheticism and dynamics foster instruction. Vesalius and Leonardo da Vinci both considered their specimens to be art in the sense of craftsmanship. 
What I show here is at most anatomical art that I wish to define as the aesthetic instructive presentation of bodily interiors. Anatomists in the late Middle Ages made the autopsia, that is, seeing with one's own eyes, the basis for all science. Lay persons have retained a fine sense for authenticity and they have a craving for it. One model looks like the other. An authentic human specimen, however, is representative of a very individual life. Lay persons have a right to view the human body so that they can form an impression of its anatomy, so that they can genuinely comprehend the body in the true sense of the word. This exhibition has been consciously made for lay persons. The reason is that lay persons are the partners of today's physicians. Consequently, they have to be educated about the human body, and they can only receive this education when they look inside genuine human bodies, just as physicians were able to do during their studies.